Four seconds. It's okay. Good morning, Desert Chapel. We are waiting on the internet to get connected, and I've been chastised over the past few weeks because I forget to talk to those people that are out there online listening to us. And we know you're out there because we, see, we can see that people click in. But if you really want us to know that you're out there, then send us a note, give us a call, let us know that you appreciate looking and watching the watching the services on Sunday morning. So thanks all of you for being here. A uh, couple of announcements. I saw that Peggy was back in the corner. Peggy, you still selling stuff back there? Peggy's always making and selling things to help benefit our music program here. So she makes some, some great bookmarks and, and other items that you can uh, do a, an, a free will offering on, or just outright give her like fifty or sixty dollars. Okay. Amen to that. Yeah. Uh, community feast. Everyone's invited to the Christmas lunch on Saturday, December twenty-third, from eleven to two in Wooler Hall. So that means everybody. So uh, come and enjoy the the community feast and see what the, the great group of volunteers do week after week in terms of serving our uh, needy people in the area. Uh, and she's, and, and uh, Nancy said to thank you for all bringing the pa plastic bags for community feast that they have enough right now for everyone so we don't need to continue bringing those. If you have extras, take them to Walmart, drop them in the box and I saw a big pile that they recycle and so that's a good use for that. Uh, let's see, we have Christmas Eve service coming up in a little over a week and that's at 5 and 7 p.m. The choir is going to sing so invite all your people to there. We had, um, we had uh, the Chargers breakfast yesterday and it was kind of disappointing because we only had what about 40 people there. Something like that Jim? Uh, 43 which is the lowest number we've ever had. So now, I need you all to, we're gonna do that again in January, so if there's any way that you can come and bring friends, because the Chargers have been doing this for, I've been here for over 20 years and they've been doing it long before that, so uh, it's a great breakfast. Uh, yesterday I managed to spill a whole cup of coffee before I even had one sip so uh, you can see some entertainment if you want to come for that as well. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. All the, everything that they make after they've bought the eggs and sausage and stuff like that, everything comes back to the church. And uh, so that's been going on for, like I said, how many years now? Thirty plus. So forty uh, is not an acceptable number. We need like sixty, a hundred. And back when we were doing Cars and Cakes, we had uh, almost 600 people. And that challenged the Chargers a bit, but maybe we can get back uh, at least over 100. So if you can do that. Or go back to Cars and Cakes, but, and that'd be great, but we need a lot of volunteers to help with that as well. So it's just another thing that we, we can do, and we know we have a lot of volunteers, and so uh, we'll, we'll think about that. All right, so Pastor, you've got a couple of things to say as well. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. We are celebrating the third Sunday of Advent today, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. It is Joy Sunday, and in the middle of Advent, in the middle of all the Christmas decorations that started at Walmart at Halloween, right, or early October, it's easy to forget that some of our neighbors and some of our friends and some of our family perhaps have misplaced their joy. They've lost it. Or maybe they're seeking it. Uh, at the same time we have three months of Christmas lights, we also have the longest nights of the year. So this coming Wednesday at six o'clock we have a special service. It's called Blue Christmas. Uh, it will be uh, some readings. It will be hymns. 
It'll be prayerful and peaceful and quiet, and it's a great opportunity to look for that peace, to seek it. It's a safe space to express grief if you're going through the season of grief. So I invite all of you to attend. Again, this is coming up in a few days right here at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. And I do have it on good authority that Michael will be there as well. So you're all invited. And now I invite Michael to bring us into worship. so blessed to have you. Thank you for that beautiful music. And if you're comfortable, please stand and join me in the call to worship. Have you noticed? Are you paying attention? God is doing a new thing. We watch and wait in the fierce joy of the coming Messiah. You know the captives? God is bringing freedom. You know the brokenhearted? God is bringing healing. We watch and wait in the fierce joy of the coming Messiah. Beloved, listen. God is calling you to be freed and to free your neighbors, to be healed and to heal your community, to testify to the light among us. We watch and wait in the fierce joy of the coming Messiah. So let us join our voices and our hearts as we proclaim the story of the one whose coming we anticipate and yet is already as close as our own breath. We come to watch, to wait, and to worship in the fierce joy of Jesus Christ, the coming Messiah. Amen. Please be seated as we have the lighting of the Advent candle.
Good morning. When God's people were surrounded by hardship, suffering, and grief, Isaiah proclaimed, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon us, because the Lord has appointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. We come today as people who are also surrounded by suffering and grief, and yet, The spirit hoovers among us, tending and anointing, inspiring freedom where there is captivity, declaring blessing in places the world has cursed, and igniting fierce joy where mourning and heartache prevail. We wait as people who experience hardship and pain, yet we are called to witness to the persistent joy that sustains our life as God's people. We light these candles as signs of our shocking hope. Just peace and fierce joy. May our lives shine with the fierce tenaciousness, tenacious joy of the light who lives in our hearts as we wait and work for the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Please stand for our next hymn. We'll sing number 234. Oh, come on. The first three... pray while you're still standing. Join me. God of hope and compassion, just as John the Baptist came long ago, and Judah 
to witness your light. We remember that light, he heralds, is the savior of hope. Sometimes it seems our world is determined to extinguish hope and light. We admit that there are times when we feel darkness is just too prevalent, too strong, and hope is just wishful thinking. May we witness through our giving, not sacristy and despair, but fierce joy, hope, and compassion. May we also witness through what we say and what we do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As we come into our time of prayer, I once again, and I, as I always do, invite you to share your concerns and praises and joys with the congregation. We are a praying church. I see that every single day. If you have a prayer request or a joy or a concern, there are multiple ways to share it. One is to put a note before service under prayer bear. Another is to fill out one of the prayer request cards in the back of the pew. You can email the office at info at desertchapelumc.org, or you can call and leave a voicemail. As a community of Christ, you are an amazing, loving group who I see and I feel pray for each other every single day. And we have the opportunity and the blessing to share several praises this morning. Joyce Fielder, her surgery was successful, and she is on her way back from Canada to visit us as soon as possible. Betty Falkowski's neck injuries have recovered. She is at eye surgery this week. We will pray for a successful eye surgery, but we have been told that she is doing better. And we also look forward to seeing her as soon as possible. We are also sharing in the praise that Mike and Mary Ann's granddaughter, Sarah, her surgery was a success, and her outlook for having children is good. Amen. As a community of Christ, we come together. We are praying for a quick recovery and a good outcome for Reed and Constance. They are visitors of United Methodist Church in Sholo. Constance is in the hospital with flu and a low oxygen level. It's possible that Reed also has flu. So let us pray for both of them as they are in this holiday season and now in a hospital. Pray for recovery and coming home and successful treatments. We continue to pray for Reese Thomas, who is a former staff member here at Desert Chapel, and his entire family. Reese is in hospice now, and he has end-stage leukemia. I've had a chance to speak with Reese this last week. He is, he is hopeful, he is positive, and he is appreciative that we as a community come, have come together to pray for him and his family. We continue to pray for Al Tosser, who's suffering from valley fever, that that can be resolved as soon as possible. We continue to pray for Ian Glithrow, who's a former pastor here. He is facing multiple medical tests and several significant health challenges this month. We continue to pray for Dawn, one of our very dedicated volunteers at the Saturday Feast. She had cataract surgery on her eye. The other eye is not repairable. We are praying that that surgery was successful and that she heals quickly. We're praying for Rose Norwood, a former member here. She broke her femur by her hip. We're praying for Rose and her family as they start a, a lengthy recovery process. And we continue to pray for Kimberly Blackstone's family. Her 24-year-old grandson was shot and killed at a Phoenix bus stop. And unfortunately, also, he was a father to a three-year-old. We pray for an end to the violence. We pray for peace and comfort as they go through a season of holiday and also grief and loss. And we pray for a child who now does not have a father. We continue to pray for Rosemary Gilly, another one of our faithful volunteers, as she is continuing to recover from stomach surgery. We continue to pray for Laura Martin as she's fighting colon cancer. We continue to pray for Jim Graham as he continues chemotherapy. 
We continue to pray for Peggy Cabrina's son, who was back in the hospital. I do share the joy from Peggy that says that they have been successful in stabilizing him and treating him, and he is doing better. That is a long recovery road. And we pray for Lori Wilburn as she continues to battle lung cancer. Let us now come together in a moment of prayer. Almighty and loving God, we come together to celebrate Advent. We come together to celebrate the birth of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And yet we walked in here today with concerns and fears and grief. And sometimes it is hard to mix those two together. And we need your help in comfort, in settling our hearts and our minds, and helping us to understand grief. We ask for your help as we know that your love surrounds us even in the darkest of days and the darkest of times. Lord, we lift up the joys of the holiday season when we are able to come together like now as a family of Christ and see friends and relatives and neighbors and spend time with family both distant and close. We thank you for those joys. And Lord, we lift up those who could not be with us today, who are in rest homes, hospice, nursing facilities, or the hospital. We ask that you help extend our love that they may feel it wherever they are and know that they are not alone and that we are with them as we know you are with them as well. And now let us spend a moment of silent prayer as we lift up those joys and concerns that we have buried deep inside. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for every breath. Thank you for every day you give us. Thank you for the world, and thank you for our friends and our family and our loved ones. And thank you for our community of Christ. We lift up all these prayers, concerns, and joys in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, as a confident community of Christ, we come together and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book, the book of John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah, they asked him. Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the world, words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had been sent to question him, then why do you baptize if you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? 
I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where God was baptizing. Where John was baptizing, I'm sorry. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now stand if you're comfortable and let's sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to the third Sunday of Advent, also known as Gaudete Sunday. I've always been curious why on the third Sunday of Advent we light a pink or rose-colored candle. It's probably because I'm colorblind, but I'm also curious theologically, so now I am happy to share that answer with all of you today. Gaudete Sunday gets its names from the opening words of the Latin introit antiphon for the third Sunday in Advent in the Roman Catholic Church. Rejoice, Gaudete, in the Lord always. It is also sometimes called Rose Sunday because it was appropriate for the celebrant of the Mass to wear rose-colored vestments. No, I did not do that today. Today, this tradition is reflected in many Protestant congregations through the lighting of the pink candle candle on the Advent wreath. Now, as a former park ranger and a lifelong scout leader, any time the world wilderness comes up, it catches my attention. In our scripture reading today, we hear the Gospel of John, version of the text that we heard last week from the Gospel of Mark. In some translations of the Bible, it says that John is, quote, calling out in the desert. In the Common English Bible, or the CEB version, it says that John is crying out in the wilderness. Now, I just got stuck on that text for a few days because as someone who spent weeks in the wilderness, the only time you ever find someone crying out is if they are hurt, lost, or crazy. The majority of people who go into the wilderness go for solitude, an opportunity for prayer, and meditation, and deep thought. 
So screaming and making noise is the way to absolutely not make good friends with your fellow campers. Now, John the Baptist was not about making friends in his life. The scriptures described a focused, serious person, possibly the cousin of Jesus, but who spent his entire life preaching and baptizing and telling the masses that they needed to be ready for the message and the ministry that Jesus was bringing. In last text from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, it described him as wearing camel hair robes and eating insects and honey from the desert. Today's text from the Gospel of John does not describe him physically, but instead describes his reception by the traditional and the powerful religious leaders of the time. We know that John the Baptist drew large crowds to his preachings and baptisms in the River Jordan. This was not a solo person talking to themselves in the desert. Rather, thousands of people were responding to his message and the religious leaders of the time. They definitely took notice of that. Neither the Gospel of Mark nor the Gospel of John have a Jesus birth narrative. Neither of the two Gospels tell us the familiar and wonderful story of the nativity, the manger, the three wise men, or the birth scene. Both Gospels go straight into Jesus' adult life and ministry. Now, the Gospel of John actually has a few nicknames. It's also called the Gospel of Life or the Spiritual Gospel. It's believed to have been written by the Apostle John, son of Zebedee, who is also the likely author of the book of Revelations. In fact, theologians and historians believe that the Gospel of John was the last of the four Gospels to have been written with a possible intent to correct certain flaws in the previous three Gospels and dispel heresies. If you notice in today's scripture, it doesn't call John, John the Baptist. It just refers to him as John. And some theologians believe that the Gospel of John was also written to discourage what had become a cult worship of John the Baptist. There are, in fact, still faith communities around the world who are centered on John the Baptist rather than Jesus. The Apostle Paul emphasizes that John the Baptist was a witness but not the Messiah. In verse 7, he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. So the religious leaders of the time, the priests and their assistants, the Levites, came to see and to question John the Baptist. Who are you? What are you doing? It's the usual questions. John was quick to say that he was not the Messiah. In the Old Testament text, there was some belief amongst the Jewish people that Elijah would precede the anticipated Messiah or Savior. And so they asked him the next question, are you Elijah? Elijah was an Old Testament prophet from the book of 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. But he's also someone who spent time in the wilderness and said some pretty unpopular things about the rulers of Israel. They asked if he was a prophet. They asked if he was the Messiah. He said no to all questions. And so they asked him, why are you baptizing? The underlying tone being, who made you think you were qualified and worthy to do such a thing? How dare you? And that's where we get our wilderness or our desert reference. I'm the one calling out in the wilderness to make a way for the Lord. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. I also got caught by the statement in both John and Mark that John the Baptist makes that he was not worthy to even untie the sandals on Jesus' feet. It caught me because Jesus teaches us that we're all worthy. So why did John the Baptist say that he was unworthy? Was it just the turn of the phrase or an emphasis that he wanted to kind of make a point with the religious leaders of the time? John the Baptist is considered representing the end of the Old Covenant, the covenant that God made with Moses and the Jewish people in the Old Testament. See, throughout the Old Testament, there's a hierarchy, both in the society and the religious leaders of the time. Not all people were treated equally throughout the Old Testament. 
I wonder if that's where John was coming from in his thoughts, that he was unworthy. Jesus teaches us that we're all servants. He demonstrated vividly at the Last Supper when he washed the feet of the disciples. If we're to be like Jesus, we are to be servants. And nothing is too low or demeaning for us to do if it is helpful and in ministry to our fellow man or woman. Worthiness and who is worthy. These are questions that humanity has struggled with throughout its existence. These are questions that plague us, perhaps more so today than even in the past. We as a culture are troubled with a lack of self-confidence, anxiety, and depression. We doubt and we question our self-worth. If John the Baptist wasn't worthy, then who are we? Our medical professionals tell us anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the United States, affecting 19 million adults over the age of 18. That represents about 20% of our population. And some believe those numbers are actually understated. Put in other terms, that means one in five adults that you see on the street are doubting their self-worth in some form or another. And God tells us that we are made in his image. We know God is perfect, So if that is so, then how and why do we question our own worth if we were made in the image of God? It's such an easy question to ask, right? But it's such a hard thing to put into practice. It's easy to forget it. We see imperfection in the mirror because we've made mistakes in our lives, because we've hurt others and because we've been hurt by others. We see imperfection in the mirror after divorces, convictions, addictions, and lost friendships. That list is long if we give in to that very human condition of doubt and question. And my friends in psychotherapy taught me a term called imposter syndrome. The Harvard Business Journal reports that imposter syndrome can be identified or defined as a collection of feelings of inadequacy that persist despite evident success. Imposters suffer from chronic self-doubt and a sense of intellectual fraudulence. This doubt overrides any feelings of success or external proof of their competence. They seem unable to internalize their accomplishments, however successful they are in their field. So even though we're made in God's image, it seems like we as humans can not help but debate or doubt our value or doubt our worthiness and our abilities. Now, I'm not here to promote narcissism, or false, overinflated egos either. There's certainly far too much of that in the world already. It's just that we as children of God need to be a little less hard on ourselves. We need to give ourselves and our fellow community members the same grace that God gives all of us. Now, I remember when our first child was born, our oldest daughter, and even though we took parenting classes, I quickly felt woefully unprepared emotionally and physically to be a good parent. At least what I've had in my head as a, quote, good parent, end quote. I quickly questioned my ability and skill to take care of this helpless infant that God had given us. And it didn't help that she cried for 90 days straight without taking a single breath. (laughs) I think back to 2012 when I was first asked to preach by the Reverend Michael Bryant. I felt totally and completely unworthy to deliver the word of God. I immediately thought that the pastor was that crazy person who was yelling in the wilderness by himself. I mean, what was he thinking? I certainly wasn't capable or worthy to do that. I would imagine that the majority of us, if we think back to our past, have times where we felt unworthy or we felt like we had imposter syndrome, even though we'd been duly educated, trained, and certified for the task at hand. If we can push through the feelings of unworthiness, we can move to uneasiness, and then we can move to actual growth. Scott Erickson, the author of Honest Advent, has this to say, the process of growth is always uneasy because growth never comes through ease. It comes through the stretching and expanding of one's own capacity to push on ahead you may very well find yourself in an uneasy situation, just like everyone else in the Bible. 
Look at the chorus of human beings in the Christmas story, and you will see the same song being sung by all of them, to trust in the goodness of God and uneasy situations, just as we are invited to sing. The only difference is that we see their entire story played out on the pages of Scripture, whereas we are right in the middle of our stories being sung, and we have no idea if this is a catchy tune or a musical disaster. Now, our scripture today announces the coming of Jesus. Jesus turned worth and unworth upside down. Jesus teaches us that human, imperfect people, people who make mistakes, in other words, us, Jesus says that we are the disciples and the ministers, not a select few powerful people. Jesus did not recruit from the stars of the lifestyles of the rich and famous. Instead, he recruited fishermen and farmers. Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors and prostitutes. Jesus healed the unclean and the rejected. Throughout his preachings and teachings, throughout his parables, throughout the Gospels, throughout the epistles, Jesus teaches us that God gives grace to us imperfect humans. And God asks all of us to minister to the last, the least, and the lost. That's the new covenant. That's what John the Baptist was preparing the way for. That we are all worthy and that we are all called to be part of ministry, no matter how imperfect our past or even our present is. That is called grace at the very heart of Wesleyan gospel. So whether we've cried alone in the wilderness or we've cried out from the wilderness, Jesus hears us. Jesus calls us home. Jesus welcomes us, feeds us, clothes us, and then sends us back into the world. John the Baptist was the harbinger, the witness, the testifier to Jesus' ministry and the coming of the new covenant. It's clear that he wasn't crying in the wilderness alone. Rather, thousands flooded to hear him and be baptized by him. People during Jesus' times were hungry for a new mission and ministry in the world. They wanted a Savior and a Messiah. Are we no less hungry for that today? God was doing something new. He was sending us his only son. We needed to hear that new covenant then and now. I certainly hope by the time of John the Baptist's death that he knew that he was, in fact, very worthy. We stand here on the third Sunday of Advent, a week away from celebrating the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Advent serves as the beginning and the reminder, as John the Baptist did two millennia ago, as he prepared the hearts and minds and people for the coming of Jesus. We are tasked to prepare our hearts and minds and our churches and our community for a rebirth and a rekindling of the Christian spirit. We are called to do no less. We are worthy, we are prepared, and we are willing. We're called to see the light of Christ and we're called to rehear the words. We are called to help others to do the same. There's no better way to say it than the poetry of the beginning of the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being said the Word was life, and the life was a light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, And the darkness does not extinguish the light. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. I now invite our ushers to come forward to receive our tithes and offerings.
and loving God, we ask for blessings upon these gifts. We ask that you make us your hands and feet in this world and help to bring your light to all those who may be in darkness. Bless the gifts, the givers, and those who are unable to give, and we ask for that and healing presence amongst everyone. We lift up all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. In this morning is number 219. What child is this? <laughs>
It's going to be 80 degrees today almost, right? 79 degrees. So that is another beautiful Arizona Sunday for you to go out and adventure into. But don't adventure too far. This is an important week. We have Blue Christmas on Wednesday at 6. We have regular service on Christmas Eve at 9 a.m. And then we have our Christmas Eve celebration and candlelit service at both 5 and 7. Go out and be the light of Christ. You are worthy, you are willing, and you are prepared. And as you go out into the world, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his countenance to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and bring you peace. Go forth. Amen.